Well, what is up, church family? Happy Mother's Day to you moms out there, to those of you that are motherly figures, to those that need that motherly touch. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being the hands and feet of Jesus. And if you want a photo, uh, we did create a photo booth out there for you. With uh, It's like right in the lobby that way. It's got some pink little like round arches. That's for you. So if mom or grandma or someone drug you here and's like, we're taking a picture before we leave, guess what? You got to do it. It's their day, okay? Uh, be obedient and just say, great, we get to do this. And uh, how many of you are like me, though? I don't like my picture taken. I don't, I don't care for pictures. Anyone else? Yeah. How many of you are like, I don't care. Pictures are fine. How many of you are just totally indifferent, don't want to raise your hand? <laughs> ha! Got you to raise your hand, though. Or you're indifferent. One of the two. All right, here we go. Well, I wanna welcome those watching online. Happy Mother's Day to all of you as well. We are jumping into our teaching series titled Temptation, Battle Ready, and this is part two. So if you have your Bible or your tablet, turn with me to Matthew chapter four. This is home base for us, Matthew chapter four. Matthew being a disciple of Jesus Christ, a tax collector, turned to disciple, a learner, a follower of Jesus, and we have his account of the life of Jesus in, the, in our scripture, Matthew. While you turn there, uh, as we jump into the series together, this is a series on spiritual warfare. I was uh, conversing with someone in between our two services, and they realized, they said this, and it was a beautiful saying. What they've come to realize is, is their journey with Christ is more and more, almost everything feels like spiritual warfare. And it is a real thing. It is a real thing. And that's what I want us to do, is to understand a little bit of spiritual warfare and unpack together the three temptations of Jesus and how that relates to us today, as well as you're gonna see those three temptations as early as the beginning of time in Genesis, the, the creation of the world. And I believe this, that there are three different categories that Jesus faced, and we often, when we get to understand those categories, we'll be better equipped to disarm the power of Satan in our own lives. Even Paul, who persecuted the church at first, was an anti-Christian terrorist, wanted to go around and stop the Jesus movement out to experience Jesus one day in a radical transformation, and then became the greatest church planner we know in the early uh, first century of the world. He writes to the church in Corinth. In fact, this church had multiple letters written to them as they're trying to understand together what is it like to follow Jesus in their culture. And Paul had to keep writing them letters to say, hey, you're close, but you're not, quit, you're not quite getting it. You know, you got to do a little course correction here. And hey, um, by the way, you've got a gentleman in your group that's sleeping with his father's wife which would be stepmom for him. You, you ought to correct that. Uh, Paul's very blunt in the letter to them to say there's correction you guys need to do. In it, he says this, writing to those Christians though, in 2 Corinthians 2.11, so that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. As the New Living Translation says, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. I think that Satan has specific strategies he uses against us to take advantage of us. And I believe the more we understand his strategies, the more we're able to walk in the way of Jesus and understand what may be coming inside of us and we can halt it before it births sin. And so I think we gotta understand the schemes. John Calvin writes this about this uh, passage we're gonna look at. He says, the artful schemes and tricks of which believers ought to be aware and will be if they allow the Spirit of God to rule in them. May the Spirit of God rule into us so we would know and become aware when we're being attacked by these certain categories. Because I know this, the enemy of our soul wants to steal our joy and peace, wants to steal our fellowship, and wants to steal our victory in the name of Jesus. But may we know his schemes and be able to say, no, not today. I know what you're doing, Satan. Get back to hell, and I'm walking with Jesus. I'm walking and being led by the Spirit to the way of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bible open, can I just say this? I love technology to a degree. 
There is nothing like a paper Bible. No, I just, just, you just smell it. Oh, it just smells, right? Pick up your phone or device. Try smelling that. Probably isn't the same. It's just not the same. There's something beautiful. Mm. Okay, we have a saying around here, just in case so you don't feel like you're weird and this is your first time here, and it's like, what is this church reciting? Uh, we have this saying up on the screen, and before we say this before we get into the word of God. I say the top, you say the bottom. You ready? We get into the word, so the? Word the word gets into us. Let's dive in together. Matthew chapter four, verses one through 11. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus told him, it is also written, do not Test the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and began to serve him. We're gonna look at the very first temptation. Last week, if you were here, we laid some groundwork and we worked on verse one. Today, we're gonna go through verses two through four together. But before we get there, let's pray together, all right? Heavenly Father, would you keep illuminating the scriptures to our hearts, to our minds, to our spirit? Holy Spirit, convict us where we need to be convicted. Help us, Lord, to see where we're falling into this temptation. God, I thank you that your son, Jesus, did not. Although he was tempted, he was still sinless. And we can look at ourselves and go, wow, we are tempted and we fall into that temptation. We sin. We miss the mark of you. Would you help us in that? Would you guide us? But would you show us where the enemy is getting us so we can walk in the victory that Jesus died and claimed victory over death and sin in our lives. May we walk in that victory right there. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, here's temptation number one. I wanna title it appetite. Temptation number one is appetite. You could use these two words interchangeably with appetite. You could say self-gratification or lust of the flesh. Self-gratification or the lust of the flesh. But appetite is number one. The first temptation is appetite. Now, let's, let's, let's look at verses two through four. Let's have some fun together. Let's, let's, let's go deep dive in and look for some golden nuggets together, right? So let's do this together. After he, Jesus, fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was what, friends? Does anyone else find that funny? I mean, it's so obvious. Of course Jesus is hungry. It's 40 days, no food. I don't know about you, I go 45 minutes and I'm hungry. And Jesus is going 40 days, of course he's hungry. But there's something so beautiful about that moment. It's last week we talk about this idea that Satan tempts us in order to get us to go away from the will of God and sin, but God tries us in order to grow maturity and character within us. See, this 40 days and 40 nights was a period of forced dependence upon God the Father. What had just hired as we, or what had just transpired, what you and I looked at last week, right before this event, was Jesus' baptism, where the Spirit of God descended down upon him and indwelt him. 
And now he's able to go into the wilderness and able to fight off these temptations. It was a moment of Jesus' own identity. Will you depend on me as the Father? You are God, my son, you are fully man and fully divine. You are fully God and fully man. Will you depend on me? And then I ask scripture questions a lot when I study. When I read scripture, I'm always asking it questions. Why are you there? What happened in this place? Why that number? So for instance, this entire study, I've been asking the question, why these three temptations? Why not more? Why 40 days? Why not 27? Why not five? Why 40? And then I ask the question, where else is 40 used in scripture? Could there be another meaning here in tied to something? See, I don't know about you, but you ever be reminded of the word 40 in the Older Testament? Deuteronomy 8, 2. This is Moses speaking. Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness. Why? So that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his command. 40 years in the wilderness. Tie it to Jesus. 40 days in the wilderness. What was the purpose of the 40 years in the wilderness here for the Israelite people who had just spent 400 years as slaves in Egypt? It was to do several things, but part of what scripture says here is they got to humble. God wanted to use this 40 years to humble them. How many of you know a little dose of humility will go a long way? He says, I need to humble you guys. Not only that, I need to know what's in your heart because I'm gonna take you to the crossroads of the ancient world to be my people to all the nations. And I need to get Egypt out of you because they were enslaved for 400 years. Do you know being in a culture for 400 years what that does to you? And if you're gonna be my people in the crossroads of the ancient world to represent me and my team, I need to get Egypt out of you. I need to know what's in your heart and I gotta make sure you're gonna keep my commands. And then a little further on in Deuteronomy chapter 18, we're told this, this is Moses still speaking. And it says this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, referring to Moses, from among your own brothers, you must listen to him. So Moses is saying, there's going to be a prophet like me coming and you must listen to him. And look what Matthew is writing, oftentimes always relating Jesus and the crowds as Jesus as a prophet. Here's what Matthew, later on in Matthew says this. Although they were looking for a way to arrest him, referring to Jesus, they feared the crowds because the people regarded him as a prophet. See, the religious leaders were afraid to arrest him because the rest of the crowds were understanding something. Is Jesus the prophet like Moses we've been waiting for? Although in their head, they have this idea that this prophet will arise and help them get out of the military oppression of the Roman government. They had no idea that the prophet that will come will be the one to give them out of the oppression of sin. And they had those mis-expectations, but they were wondering, is there something different about Jesus? Because what happened with Moses is he led him out of the oppression of Egypt, through the waters, into the 40 years of wilderness, of testing. But yet, Jesus, you are going to be a prophet, and you will rise up and get him out of the slavery of sin. And you're gonna go through the waters of baptism into the 40 days of wilderness temptation. What Matthew is constantly reminding us is that Jesus' life is written on the canvas of the Exodus. That this, this is why the Old Testament matters to the New Testament. In order to understand everything in the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. And this is why Jesus says, look at me. I'm the fulfillment of everything that you guys are reading. 
what is your Bible, your Torah, your Pentateuch, I'm the fulfillment of all that. Here's a correlation, because Hosea also says, out of Egypt I will call my son. Where did Jesus go when he was about two years old? He fled to Egypt, because Herod was killing all the babies two years and younger. See, Moses led the exodus from the slavery of Egypt, but Jesus led the exodus from the slavery of sin. And Matthew's audience, he's writing to the Jews. That's his intended audience, are the Jews. The, the most Jewish gospel is Matthew, because he knows his audience. And he's trying to show them something. Listen, Jesus was the prophet we waited for. He is the new Moses. Here, you have Jesus fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, dependence on the Father, just like Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt in the wilderness for 40 years. And then it says this, then the tempter approached him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And when you look at that at first, I don't know about you, I look at that, I'm like, that's just a weird temptation. Like seriously, turn stones into bread? Like Jesus could if he wanted to. But I'm like, why that? Oh yeah, it makes more sense. I mean, sometimes we don't have to dig deep to realize scripture speaks for itself. Why stones to become bread? Because he's hungry. Oh yeah, that makes sense. But here, let's journey into the wilderness for just a moment in Israel to understand this, because we don't understand this as much as what the first century people w would. So we gotta jump back in their time. Here's a picture I took nine years ago in the wilderness, of Egypt, uh, the wilderness in Israel. I'm standing right there to understand something. The wilderness is not sand, it's not the Sahara Desert, it's rock, rock, rock. I spent 12 days in the land of Israel nine years ago and had to throw away my shoes. They were a brand new pair of shoes I took on this trip. That's how rugged the wilderness is. It destroyed my shoes. Yet for 40 days, Jesus spends here, and the Israelites spend 40 years here. Picking up the tabernacle, moving, putting the tabernacle down, picking up, moving all the time. But there's an interesting geological thing that happens in the wilderness. There's a certain rock it's a limestone that has a tendency to look like a piece of bread or a loaf of bread. There they are. Does that not look on the left like, a, like you just did a loaf of bread over a fire? And the one on the right looks like a little piece of bread that you had broke open. See, for 40 days, Jesus would have saw these things. As you and I are hungry because we know the time and lunch is in 20 minutes from now and some of our bellies already are gurgling, 40 days. And he can look at the geological landscape and go, wow, this is reminding me of food everywhere. Like, I really could, like I'm, I'm fasting, but I could at the snap of my fingers. I just gotta say the words. Rock turned to bread and it would. But here's what I realized something. We don't understand this need because in our culture today, everything is so convenient. Right? Lean in. Convenience decimates dependence. Convenience decimates dependence. I mean, we even have stores called convenience stores. Right? Everything now is open 24-7. I mean, you and I get hungry. Listen, we don't even have to leave the house to get fast food anymore. We can door dash and people bring us fast food and food. Like we, have, we live in a culture that is so convenient, but in their culture, they were hungry like that. You would have to pray to God, God, give us something to eat. Get us manna from heaven. If they wanted water, you'd have to pray, God, send us the rains or help us get water. You and I are thirsty. We just walk over to the kitchen and get water. I'm, I'm curious in our own culture today, if Satan can get us dependent on fast food places, on doctors, which I love them and I need them, but more dependent upon doctors than me going to him for my healing first, 
or convenient places, what else will the devil put in our lives that we will become dependent on ourselves for and not him? Come on, Jesus, you have the power right now to flip it all. You don't have to be hungry anymore in a just like that, do it. And here's the temptation of our appetite in this moment. We are tempted to satisfy our appetites and our own desires apart from the will of God. We are tempted to satisfy our appetites and our own desires apart from the will of God. And our culture screams that line. If it feels good, do it. If it feels good, do it. If you have a desire or that appetite deep down inside of you, just do it. What does it matter? Just do it. Jesus, satisfy your soul. Rely on yourself rather than on God. And Satan wants Jesus to selfishly use his ability to meet his own need. But this is exactly like the garden. In Genesis chapter three, when everything, when sin entered the world, look at what this says. The woman saw. See, our appetite never begins in the heart. It always begins with the eyes first. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. And look at it, delightful to look at. And that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave it to her husband. Key words, dudes. Who was with her and he ate it. Right? Some of us in our, in our, in our little theology are like, ha, see, it's the woman's fault. <clears throat> the guy's right there. The issue is the guy's not doing his headship job. The guy's not doing his job. Yeah, she ate it, but right, he, he right there. You know what he is? Passive, lazy, that's what that is right there. And he never stopped into his God-given role. Why? Because our appetite craves. Our appetite craves in the depths of our own heart. And why didn't Adam? I'm suggesting to you because Adam craved it just as much as Eve did. It's that she saw, but so did he. He's right there. She saw, she thought, that's delightful. I would, I would bet you, so did he. That's delightful. I want that. See, you fill in that appetite. Your lust of the flesh craves in the depths of our own hearts. Your self-gratification craves in the depths of our own heart. And you guys, if you know the story of Adam and Eve, what happened next is sad. What happened next is then the eyes of both of them were open and they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. I like to put myself in the story. What was that like for Adam and Eve? To all of a sudden go, oh! We're naked. We got to do something. And then the God shows up and says, Adam, where are you? Again, it's not a GPS question. It's a spiritual question. Where are you? Here's why. Because you're out of the will of God now. See, we're tempted to satisfy our appetites and our own desires apart from the will of God. We have those things in us, and Paul's very clear. It's the fleshly desires within us. It's the fleshly desires within us. The problem with the flesh is it's bent towards sin. This is why believers, as Paul writes, you've got to be spirit-led, not flesh-led. So the question becomes, oh, I want you to know this. These appetites can be food in either extreme, by the way. It could be food as in overeating food. And it can be the other way where anorexia sets in. And you don't want it. It could be those extremes. These appetites could be shopping. It could be your identity. It could be relationships or exercise. 
For some of you, it, it's healthy to exercise, but some of you have elevated exercise as an idol now, and it's unhealthy. Not only that, but sex as well. Please lean in. This is where Satan wants to attack you and I. Attacks our desires and our appetites, our fleshly appetites. And he, if he can convince many disciples of Jesus that your desire and your appetite defines who you are, please lean in. That is not true in the name of Jesus. You, this morning, if you believe and trust in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, your identity is a child of God. That is who you are. It doesn't mean as a child of God, you will never want something of the flesh anymore. That isn't in accord with Jesus' will for you. That doesn't mean it. But what we do mean is you, we must do what Jesus did. When appetite is birthed, you and I must do what Jesus did. And he gives us an example in Matthew 4.4. 4. Jesus answered, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on the very word that comes from the mouth of God. Very simple. How did he combat sin? He combated sin or the temptation. He combated temptation with scripture. But here's what's interesting. As we'll unpack next week, Satan knows scripture as well because he tried using scripture against Jesus. So hang in for next week. But right here, Jesus is quoting scripture found in Deuteronomy 8.3. This is what it says. He humbled you by letting you go hungry. Remember, this is written to the Israelites in the, desert, in the wilderness. See how it correlates to Jesus as well for the 40 days he's there. Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your ancestors had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. He quotes scripture, and he quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. See, here's what Jesus did in the midst of facing his temptation of lust of the flesh and appetite. Jesus trusted the all-satisfying and all-sufficient goodness of the Father. He trusted. How many of us, though, we actually trust that the worldly appetite will satisfy us more than the Father will? We don't live an abundant life by feeding on our fleshly desires. We'll live an abundant life when we feed on the word of God. And that's what Jesus did. He knew the scriptures. And lean in. Some of us today, even those that are watching online, some of us today, we are suffering from spiritual malnutrition. Because what we're dependent on, truthfully, lean in, I love you. And you're like, Ryan, it's Mother's Day, be nice, I love you. You're depending on the pastor of this church to give you the word every week and say you're good till next week. Dig it, eat it, you go in it. Hey, the same God that speaks to me speaks to you. I just create a lot, probably a lot more space in my life and my rhythms than you do, that's all. I may have a special anointing to lead the local church, but you've got anointing too, and you've got people where you work, live, and play who need to know Jesus Christ, and God's saying, get in my word because I've got a word for you to give to them but we won't get in the word. He's sitting there going, you've got a temptation that you've been battling far too long. How many times are you finally gonna feed him on my word? How many times are we gonna get in? Listen, don't start in Leviticus. Don't confuse yourself. Get into the gospels. Know your savior. Know your Messiah. Know your Lord Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Start there and just start feeding on it. And eventually, to create a habit, today's studies say it takes 66 days. It's going to take you 66 days every day to say, I'm going to devote time to Jesus. Oh, Lord, speak to me. I, this is, I'm new at this. I don't know what it looks like. Matthew 1, an account of the genealog genealogy of Jesus. Great. i got to start here. Abraham fathered Isaac, other fathered Jacob, Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers, and Judah fathered Perez and Zebra by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered, like, do you see sometimes it can confuse us and we're like, I don't want to start there. Hey, everything worth it is challenging if you persevere through. It'll be worth it. 
I promise you. Here's my promise to you as your lead pastor of this church. I promise you this. This church will not offer cotton candy or Kool-Aid teaching. Okay? I'm going to promise you this. Something that looks good and tastes good but has no substance will not be preached from this stage. I'm, I'm declaring that right now to you. This church will meet spiritual needs over felt needs any day of the week. Felt needs are important, but your number one need and the world's need is a spiritual need ever before a felt need. That's why Jesus came. He said, repent. Repent and believe. And we have a spiritual need in our own hearts and in the walls outside of these walls here. There's a spiritual need, and people need to know Jesus Christ. And please lean in. I love you. Let's do this together. Let's feed on the word together. Let's challenge each other together. I, I don't agree, honestly, as your pastor. Listen, there are things in this that challenge me, and I'm like, God, I don't like that. Like, it would be easier if it was this way. But you know what ultimately I have to do as a disciple of Jesus Christ to say this rules. His word, it's living and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. And I have to bow my knee to the word of God instead of my own thoughts. Because as soon as I do, I worship myself and not God. And I'm going to have to learn. I'm, gonna, I'm praying that we would learn to bow together. To have healthy disagreements and discussion. And our disagreements say, hey, let's, let's look at scripture. What does that say? I know, I know. But what does it look like to not have culture dictate where we're going, but have Christians rise up and say the word of the Lord says this and the Spirit's leading me and now we're dictating what culture does, not culture dictating what the church does. Yeah. Sorry, it's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, mothers. <laughs> we love you. Lead in. Uh, worship team, make your way up. Worship team. The challenge for us in the appetite is this. And we must know this. The bread of demons destroys. The will and word of God satisfies. And some of us, we're, our appetite for honest and we look inwardly, it goes, man, it's just full of the world and the desires of the world. God put some wonderful desires inside of us. But those desires will always match his will for his kingdom and his purposes and his glory. So how do we balance that? I think in Matthew, Matthew 6, verses 33, Jesus is writing or he's speaking his Sermon on the Mount, the greatest probably message that Jesus ever brought. He brought all these teachings and parables, but this is the longest discourse that we have that he brought to the crowds. And he says this, and he's bringing kingdom principles about the kingdom of God here. And he says, but seek first. But seek first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. See, our appetite's big because our fleshly desires point us to things of the world that will never satisfy. And Jesus is very clear. Seek me above it all. Seek the kingdom of God and my righteousness and the things you wish you had. Oh, you'll have, but in spiritual ways because your spiritual nourishment is greater than your physical nourishment. So what I want to do is in a moment, we're going to change up the way we end a little bit. For some of you, I'm going to be honest, this is going to stretch you. For others of you, you're like, yes, I love this. But we do life together. Isn't it going to be cool one day when God calls us all home? I don't know what kind of memory we'll have in heaven. I don't know. I think it be cool one day to see each other in heaven and go, we did it together. together we challenged each other and we stood before Jesus we heard the words well done God and faithful servant we did it together we did it together I want to ask you three questions question number one what are you trusting in God for today Maybe perhaps some of you, you've been trusting in those worldly appetites that you have out there. 
but not God. You're not trusting in God to fulfill that, whatever that innate need is inside of you. Maybe for some of you, you just need some healing and a miracle today. Are you trusting in God for that? Second question, what are you fearful of today? I often wonder if appetite craves in the depths of our hearts because ultimately we're fearful of missing out on something. And so maybe perhaps the emotion, the thing that underlies the appetite is fear. You chase exercise, dieting, shopping, all this image stuff. Because deep down there's a core of fear. What are you fearful of? And lastly, what appetite do you have that's taking you away from Jesus? I'm going to ask our, our prayer partners, will you please go to the corners by the banners, our prayer partners. Maybe some of you, you read those questions, you know exactly where the Lord's speaking. Maybe you just need, our prayer partners are awesome. They're here to serve you. Maybe you just need prayer right now. You need to, you need, I need to go to someone with prayer and lift me up to the throne room of grace. They're here for you. Maybe the invitation is like me right now. Maybe for some of us, the invitation is to come to the altar and to the sides by the stairs and you just have to kneel. You literally have to get into this posture to say there are appetites, Lord, I need to give to you and I want more of you. And I promise you, because we love each other, if you need to wiggle your way through to get up front, it would be awesome to have a bigger worship center that we can move like this. But would you come and kneel with me? And I'm going to wait. Because I know there's some of us that we need this posture. Would you be willing to come and kneel? You just got to do a work with God in this moment. And as your heart is racing and you have sweaty palms, it was this posture I took to finally defeat my appetite of pornography. I remember like it was today. You ever had an appetite that you're like, God, I keep giving this to you. It feels like I keep going back to that thing. I don't want it anymore. That's what I said over and over and over. And I kept wondering, why? Why does this keep coming? One day I got into my shower and I got on my knees exactly like this with the shower raining down on me and I raised my hands and said, God, you got to kill this appetite. I can't take it anymore. You've got to kill it. And I need you. I need your spirit to lead me and fill me greater than what this appetite is killing me right now. What it took for me and my walk, a posture of my knees to surrender. Maybe that's you today. And I know you can kneel right and make an altar right at your seat. But I'm going to open the altars up and the sides up if you need to kneel. Would you be willing to come and kneel? And the team's going to play a song over us called The Dove. It's all about the Spirit of God. If we're truly going to be temptation and appetite, we need to have a feeling of the Spirit of God. Remember, Jesus was filled with the Spirit. He's now immediately led by the Spirit. And now he's spending time with his Father, just feeding on the Word and the Father. May you and I do that today.